For years, those of us who have cared for mechanically ventilated patients have taken a very narrow view of success. Did we keep them free of complications, including pneumonia? Were we able to move them out of the ICU alive? Historically, we keep patients on the ventilator heavily sedated, and we rely on a physician's judgment to determine whether patients can breathe well enough on their own. Despite these good intentions, we have learned that this approach carries risks. Months or years after leaving the hospital, patients can be plagued with debilitating muscle weakness. Many patients complain that they cannot climb up the stairs in their home or get back to the activities that they enjoy. They often have recurrent nightmares as their brains replay visions of horrible things that they believe they saw when they were delirious in the hospital. They can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, remembering the experiences of lying immobile and not knowing what was happening to them. They may even have in trouble thinking clearly at work or simply balancing their checkbook. As these long-term outcomes have come into focus, we are beginning to redefine what it means to successfully treat a ventilated patient. All current therapies point to the importance of reducing these complications by getting patients off the ventilator as soon as possible. Here at the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute, we are drawing on published guidelines and have incorporated three groups of interventions into our improvement approach. And we're working with hospitals across the country to put them into place. The first set involves creating an overarching protocol to address ventilated patients' pain, agitation, and delirium. For example, once a day, we should assess the patient's readiness to have their breathing tube removed. We do this by interrupting their sedation and allowing them to wake up. Simultaneously, getting them to breathe on their own without a ventilator. Patients should also be screened every day for delirium and we should actively try to reverse that. The next set of interventions focuses on getting ventilated patients moving earlier in their ICU stay. Every day, we should evaluate the maximal level of mobility that a patient can achieve safely, and then we should strive to help them meet those goals. This might mean turning the patient from side to side in bed, dangling their legs from the edge of the bed, or even walking the patient within the intensive care unit while still on a ventilator. The third area involves preventing acute lung injury through the use of low tidal volume ventilation, which ensures that the ventilator does not force too much air into the patient's lungs. For decades, we have known that decreasing the tidal volume that patients receive on a ventilator is an effective strategy to treat acute lung injury. Now, we know it's also a strategy to prevent complications that can prolong the need for mechanical ventilation and lead to significant morbidity and mortality. We see that when we can perform these steps regularly, patients benefit by reducing short-term and long-term complications. But so do our hospitals, where we see gains in throughput and efficiency by getting patients off the ventilator and out of the hospital faster. In 2014, the CDC reported that 12 ICUs had re reduced complications associated with ventilation through the use of daily combined awakening and breathing trials. The program decreased the duration of ventilation by nearly two and a half days and decreased hospital length of stay by more than six days. Translating these steps into everyday practice is no simple task. 
It requires frontline care providers to coordinate their efforts. It involves changing attitudes and accepting new ways of thinking about our role as healers. That is where the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute comes in. Together with Harvard, the Michigan Keystone Center, and other collaborators, we have packaged the evidence into a program that not only provides a practical approach to implement these evidence-based interventions, it also provides a framework to engage frontline staff and provide the training and leadership support that they need to improve care. We believe deeply that this work needs to be led by frontline staff. So the program provides educational content and guides teams to set up unit-based safety programs. We give teams practical data collection tools and reports to help them understand how they are performing over time and compare to others participating in the program. Ultimately, we strive to change the culture of critical care. We need to look beyond the vital signs. We need to think about more than just helping ventilated patients to survive, but helping them to recover quickly and to thrive.